is Ashley. Welcome to Cyber Therapy. And this is my lovely host, co-host, Tyler. AKA I got, not Tyler. I got the lovely moniker today. I'm the lovely yes. co-host. Yeah. Okay. I'll Are you take not that. lovely? I guess most people would say you're not lovely. So that's okay. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right. We're starting right out into it, Ash. Okay. I see where this is going. And here is my not so lovely co host, Tyler. Introduce yourself, Tyler. <laughs> so, um, how was your weekend? It's been a little bit since we've been. We last talked to what? Jason Chan. It's been a couple weeks. What's yeah. New? This is episode 11. Um, mm-hmm. Pretty excited to be in the double digits now officially. My weekend. What did I do this weekend? Oh geez. Oh, I had a. I screwed up my back, so I was. I was. I just laid low this weekend. You know, I have old people problems. You know, I, I walk funny with bad bad back and all that kind of stuff. But no, I just kind of laid low this weekend, chilled out with the fam, hung out. How about you? Anything fun? Yeah, I hurt my back too, but that was because I went skiing and uh, you know went to the back side of the mountain for the first time. Which you was know fun. you're supposed to keep the skis on the snow. Yeah, it that didn't happen. I definitely <laughs> took a tumble. Um, probably the worst tumble I've had in, in a while. So, uh, so yeah, it's definitely sore, but I'm good now. So, so I'd like to bring up a topic today yes. before we get going. Mm-hmm. I'd like to know your thoughts on pork barbecue versus beef brisket. What is a better, and heck, I'll even throw in there turkey or chicken as well. What is the best barbecue meat to eat? In general? No, not in general, specifically. So I know, but like, so (laughs) in general, I tip, if I go to eat barbecue, I usually like some brisket. However, since I came out here to Colorado, there have been a couple places that actually have a really good dry rub chicken. And like one of my other friends, like he got into uh, smoking wings and a whole bunch of meat and he does a real good dry rub chicken wing. Okay. so you can only it eat one. You can only eat life. one for the rest of your life. Which one is it? Probably the chicken, honestly. If I had to choose between the two. Oh, boy. I wouldn't choose the beef. Our, our guest is going to have a field day with you. <laughs> he really is. He really is. I believe it. Yeah. So so our guest today is, again, another old friend of mine that I worked with. I uh, started working with about 10 years ago, I believe now. Roughly 10 years ago, we started working together. We were much younger then, and I had a lot more hair, and he most certainly – no, he didn't. He's always had the same amount of hair as long as I've known him. Let's bring my good friend Rick Holland on the show. Woo! There he hello, is. Hello. Welcome. There he is. You know, from one chrome dome to another, my friend. How are you? I am good. It's good to be here with y'all. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Great to see you again. Um, I want to dive right into the most meaty topic we're going to have today. No pun intended. Exactly. I want to discuss barbecue. It says here um, uh, on your uh, LinkedIn, it says you are a, and of course now I got something popping up in the way, you are a CISO, a cybersecurity executive, a public speaker, a forester research veteran, and a barbecue enthusiast. And and I'm going to just throw some shade on on the last piece there, barbecue enthusiast. What makes you truly a barbecue enthusiast? And just because you live in Texas doesn't mean that you're a barbecue enthusiast. I mean, everybody can be an enthusiast because it just means you like something. So it's very, the, 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 the bar is very, very low for being an enthusiast about something. Okay. Now I'm going to chuck Ashley under the bus. What do we think about barbecue chicken? I... <laughs> I, I, I think it's fine. I think it's fine. You have a platter. When you go to a barbecue spot, you get a platter, right? And mm-hmm. I will get poultry. Tur- usually I go turkey over chicken because I like turkey breast uh, quite a bit. Um, and then my kids will take that as leftovers as well. Um, but yeah, just to get this out of the way, like I don't hate on pork. I like to have the best barbecue <laughs> in the region that I'm at. So when actually... You and I have had barbecue together in in Raleigh or Raleigh area, and I've had pork there. So I will do that. I will not get brisket in North Carolina, and I generally will not get pulled pork in Texas. You know, I want to get what the region does best. It's like I see. you go to San Francisco, you want to have Asian food, you want to have seafood. Yes. I'm not going to get brisket in San Francisco. No offense to any pit masters out there listening. <laughs> any pit masters in San Fran? <laughs> you should also get tri-tip. Tri-tip out in California. Mm. I love tri-tip. Wait a minute. That's tri-tip a thing. California delicious. tri-tip is a thing. Yeah. Oh, you don't know. You don't know about that. It's. I mean, it's made. It's tri-tip is a thing beyond California, especially here in Texas, because so many Californians have relocated here. All of the butcher shops have tri-tip. I actually love to do tri-tip because unlike a brisket that takes an entire weekend, you know, I can do a one-hour reverse sear on tri-tip 
and have it ready to go. And like pound for pound, there's a lot of value in, in the cost of it relative to how much food you get. I love tri-tip. Wow. Look at this. I learned something every day. I didn't even know tri-tip was a California thing. That That is news to me. But for those listeners of the show that don't know, uh, I live in North Carolina. And in North Carolina, the only kind of barbecue worth getting is pork. You don't get, you don't get beef here. You just don't bother. I guess that's a Texas thing. But let me ask you the same question I asked Ashley before, as we started the show, though. You can only have one kind of meat, barbecue meat, for the rest of your life. Is it beef? Uh, no, because I think uh, brisket, beef ribs, whatever, beef cheeks, all ones that I cook pretty often, they're so rich. I mean, it's like I have a quarter pound of beef brisket or something like that. I like pork belly. I love pork belly in all you know, you can do Hold pork on a minute. belly. So, Asian so style. you can only have one meat. What is it for the rest pork of your life? Belly. One barbecue meat. Is it pork? It's pork belly. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Stop the press. It's, it's not, it's not pulled pork. It's, it's pork. pork. Belly. It's pork. But you went pork against belly. the Texas crew. How can you do that? I love I'm so calling belly. this out I, on Twitter. I, as soon as we get done here, this is going right on I Twitter. I love, I love pork <laughs> belly burnt in. It's my, Favorite, if I could have one bite of barbecue in my life, it's it's pork belly burn ins. So I'm talking all the smack, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'm talking all the smack at the end of the day. I don't like any of it. I eat barbecue turkey. So <laughs> that's always what I get. We've got, a question. We've got a question from the audience from Jasmine. And she's asking, have you had a Memphis sushi at a Tennessee barbecue restaurant, Bill? I want to. I don't know what that is, but I want it. It sounds amazing. I'm going to have to Google food that as soon as we get done here. I'm, I think, never mind. Uh, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> my brain split into, my best friend in, is in town. And so we went and did trivia last night. And one of the questions was like, what does, what does sushi actually mean? And we got the question wrong. But Small now bites. I can't me. Is that what it is? So yeah, all finger, that makes sense then. Fem I think it means finger food or small bite. <laughs> Thank you for the thank you for the the color there, Jasmine. Apparently, it's sliced summer sausage, cheese, saltines, and paprika. That actually sounds really good. How does she say that's terrible? That sounds <laughs> awesome. I do like summer sausage, though. I do too. I'm a big fan, especially around Christmas time. Mm. It's funny, you know, of all those of all those things that that I read across in in your in your profile, the thing we open up with and the thing we dive into is meat, right out of the gate. Most important thing: the heck with security and cyber and. <laughs> You know, all the analyst work you've done and the fact that you're a CISO at a, at a major company, all I care about is what kind of meat do you like? I want to get, get out of cyber altogether and cook for people. That would be my... Uh, really? I, I love the pre-pandemic. We would have uh, uh, Digital Shadows cookouts at my house every fall and spring, and I'd cook for probably 40 to 60 people each time. So I really, I really like to cook for people. The pandemic's kind of reduced that quite a bit. Um, but now it's kind of gearing up. So hopefully I'll get a good cook in the spring and feed a lot of people. Nice. Have you entered, have you ever entered into any competitions? I did one at my kids, uh, elementary school and I'll have, I'm happy to report that I was best overall and best brisket for that. Um, won. Hey Rick, real quick, I'm going to interrupt there. You can't cook against kids and really call that a win. <laughs> <laughs> Just can't, bro. It doesn't count. I was the only adult. I was the, <laughs> the only adult. Everybody else is, 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 they were putting their stuff in the easy bake oven for the weekend and hoping that it came out done. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, it was exciting. And I got a $50 gift uh, card to a butcher, which actually I bought tri tip with. So take it back to tri tip. That was my victory prize. Nice. Delicious. Ah. So, I suppose we should talk about something that the audience really cares about other than. Yes. We made, we've made some people hungry, though. That's for sure. I'll tell you what, I actually didn't eat lunch today. I had I had a uh, cupcake for lunch, so I'm dying. I'm like ready to to drive directly down to the closest barbecue right now. Sounds fantastic. All right, open us up, Ashley. Well, let's talk about something real here. Yeah, so uh, w one of the other things that's in your Twitter profile is that you're a Forrester veteran. So um, do you mind kind of just giving us a little background? How did you get your start at Forrester? What did you cover? That sort of stuff. Yeah, my... Uh... My start to Forrester was through John Kindervog, who many people will know John's name as the creator of Zero Trust. So I had been friends with, with Kindervog for maybe, a, I don't know, 10 years or so before I was at Forrester. And I was a sales engineer and he was a couple years into Forrester and they wanted to build out the team. They wanted to have some more technical coverage. So he's like, hey, do you want to apply for this? And I, I had never been at a company where we could, I had come from EDU as my last practitioner job. And 
we didn't have Gartner. We didn't have Forrester. I didn't know what it was. I went through this, Tyler, I don't know how long your recruiting process was, but mine was probably like three months long and grueling where I research and present. And, you know, I finally did my presentation in, in, in the, in the Dallas office and uh, John was there and I was like, dude, I'm just so glad I'm done with this hiring process. If I get the job or not, I'm just glad to be done in, in the most difficult recruiting, you know, gauntlet that I've been through. And, you know, somehow I got the job, I guess they, you know, they really needed me, I guess, or something, or the candidates were, I was the best of the bunch. And, uh, <laughs> As a as a new forester analyst, well, at least for me anyway, you know, you just kind of inherit coverage areas. You don't get to create typically your coverage area unless they're recruiting you for a specific one. So when I started, I I they needed some incident response. They needed email and web gateways, the super exciting uh, <laughs> uh, space uh, at the time. But eventually, I got to create the threat intelligence coverage at Forrester. So I did the first research there, and I came from the intelligence community from the Army. So I think I still pretty unique in that in the analyst community. You didn't really have anybody that came out of an intelligence agency of some sort. Um, so that was kind of my, my claim to fame at Forrester was setting that up and, and covering the thready stuff. And it was four and a half really good years, um, but a lot of travel. I did 100K plus every year on, on planes and stuff like that. So it was pretty grueling. Yeah, that's the gauntlet, the, uh, the, the analyst life. You know, everybody thinks it's amazing. It's staying five-star hotels and you know, fly everywhere and check out all these cities. And it's, it's, it's very grueling. It can definitely wear you down over the course of, you know, about four years, kind of the four or five years, I'd say is the life cycle of a typical analyst before they get burned out and ready to jump off the top of the closest building. Yeah. You're either a lifer, the few that are lifers, or you, you, you move on to the dark side, as some people would say, um, to the vendor land, or I would say I got out of the dark side to come to vendor land. Yeah. It's definitely arguable either way. So, so I want to follow up a little bit on that and say, in the in the area that you covered, you you covered threat intel since what 2010, 2011? 10 years, um, ten years, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's changed? What's I mean, that's a decade of change in a market that's still considered rather nascent and young, right? Threat intel is not an ancient market by any means. There's still innovation occurring in that market. What's changed in the ten years you've been covering it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we have started to embrace, although slowly, there's just this affinity or love of IOCs. Um, and I used to call them or still do indicators of exhaustion. People get really focused on <laughs> IOCs and really there's more to threat and tell than a bunch of, you know, atomic indicators and mutexes and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's been a slow, it's been a slow transition over the years, probably for about four or five years, we've been moving away from IOCs. But unfortunately, IOCs are still such a big pivot point for your security controls, your detective controls, your preventive controls, they're still in the mix. I think the transition that you're seeing on shops that have been on this threat intel journey for a number of years, they're trying to have more strategic stuff. They're trying to show value to their businesses. And that might be they're involved in the MA process and they're trying to help out mm. with due diligence. Um, they're trying to use a, a threat and risk-based approach to their security investments. So I still think we struggle on the more strategic side um, we're pretty good on the tactical operational side, but strategic is where I still see a lot of room for growth. Yeah. And for those that don't know that are listening to the show, IOC is in indicators of compromise. And so in the threat intel world, correct me if I'm wrong, like I'm not, I'm not an, a threat intel person by any means, but in that world, generally you collect indicators of compromise. You surface those when they make sense, when they're validated and real to get people to react to those threats and, and shut them down in the individual case of their environment. And what Threat Intel does at a fundamental level is look at all the individual information that it can find out there on the internet, in the dark web, in the, in the crevices where people don't like to, to crawl, pull that back and say, hey, there's indicators of a compromise somewhere out there or to e equate the threats back to your business. Is that, is that kind of a good fundamental way of talking about the space? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, you from an one one version for, for yeah, somebody who doesn't a, know anything about it. No, no, no. From an operational perspective, right? Essentially you get an email, like I always recommend create your own threat Intel, right? So you get a phishing email. Well, you're going to capture the domains, the IPs, maybe it's the email address of the sender, and that becomes an indicator for you. That's some type of data. And then you put that data into your detection stack and your prevention stack, and you're trying to prevent 
getting fish in the future from that domain, or you're using that domain to do research to try to understand the infrastructure, you know, what you can find historically about it. So, so really, I think the important thing is you start with your own stuff. Don't go buy threat intel from a third party. Mm build off of your own incidents and intrusions that you have and you start building out this dossier of who's attacking us what tools do they use what infrastructure do they use and you use that to start putting a picture together hmm. how do people typically track that information just like in a spreadsheet <laughs> well, or like, it, you know it always comes something back more to sophisticated right? it always comes back to uh, excel in, in in a lot of ways, especially for less mature shops. This actually goes back to your question, uh, Tyler, as well as about what has changed. When I left Forrester, so six years-ish ago, you had these threat intelligence platforms, which are still a thing, but the market is kind of, and, and it was like a library for all your threat information. But now with SOAR and SIM and XDR, people are not necessarily looking for a point solution that's just going to do house their threat intel data. They're looking to get into other tools in their environment. So you only see it really the, the cream of the crop, the top 10% where they might actually have a dedicated platform that they're using to house this information. Uh, a lot of people will use Excel. They'll use it what's in their SIM. Uh, they may use... Uh, you know, whatever kind of, I mean, some people may use Google Docs that link out to Google Sheets and things like that, where they have mm -hmm. both the, you know, the contextual information and the indicator, the technical information together. But for most people, you know, if, if you're not doing this, capturing Excel would be a good place to start. And then you can grow from there. It doesn't always go back to Excel. Everything always goes back to Excel. Like if you take Jupiter One, for instance, cyber asset management and governance, do it in Excel. Start with Excel. At least do something. At least have an idea of what you have. Now, you'll very quickly get well past that capability yeah, if you're you of any size. It. But, but yeah, it always, it always comes back to, to Excel. Um, wh why, why did you jump to the vendor side? What from the analyst life did you say, I just can't do it anymore? And I, I, so, you know, for full disclosure, I was, I was talking to Rick throughout this whole process. So I already generally know the real answer. I don't know if he'll give the real answer. We'll see. But um, I know the real answer why he left. But Rick, why did, you, why did you jump to the vendor side? And what excited you about moving over that, that world from the analyst space? Well, you know, part of it, which we kind of talked about with the travel, like you just burned out, especially in the Forrester model that had a lot of travel pre-pandemic. So you were just exhausted, 100,000 miles, you know, top tier status on one airline. Some analysts would have it on multiple airlines. So there was there was a burnout factor to it. But for me, it was I had spent four, four and a half years telling people what I thought they should do, you know, giving advice to vendors on what they should do, giving enterprises advice based on what I saw. But I felt like I was sitting in the ivory tower. Mm. I was, you know, at that point, I was six and a half years from removed from being a practitioner. So I felt like I was going stale, kind of like mm. milk that was left out. So that was a component to it, but I wanted to build something, you know, I wanted to come to a startup and try to practice what I had preached and, and try to help develop a company, grow a company. Um, and then now kind of grow certain disciplines within a company, you know, I wanted to build things. So that's kind of, it was a, it was a kind of a, a culmination of multiple things that led me to leave, uh, to leave the uh, analyst world. And you landed as a CISO. No, no. I actually, when I first started, I was just VP of strategy. And, and this is not an uncommon destination for industry analysts is when we leave, especially if you go earlier stage, right? You go to a smaller company and you wear a ton of different hats. So I did a ton of different things for the first two years. Interesting. And then you migrated eventually to a, to a CISO role. Mm -hmm. And we is that were, because... You felt you could provide the best value for a business, help them understand things, run things differently. What was the reason you, you gravitated towards CISO? So, for example, I can tell you, like, I will never be a CISO. No desire to ever be a CISO. It's not in my genes, not in my, my DNA. I just can never do it. For me, I gravitated indirectly to CMO, which I would have never guessed coming into, this, into the later phases of my career. But, you know, you, you gravitate to where you need to be and where you should be. So what attracted you to CISO life? Well, I think part of it, and you'll appreciate this from startup life, like you do the things that need to be done for the business because you're an executive and you're trying to do the right things and grow the business. We had a need. Uh, we were maturing and growing and customers wanted to know that the, the, the vendors they were using had due diligence, were doing the right things. So I got to stand up the program. And so for me, 
that was what was really attractive about this, the security side was I wanted to leave Forrester to kind of stand up and help grow a company. And now it's like, we need to grow a functional area within digital shadows. And I did that. And then I picked up several others over the years as well. So it was kind of like that builder thing. Now I get to build something um, within the company to try to help it scale to the next level. Although I will tell you the idea of being a consultant and a Forrester analyst after solar winds, log four J <laughs> half Neum, Ukraine, Russia war, you know, the idea of going back and, and giving advice, um, uh, sitting in the ivory uh, tower and taking a break, get, uh, get, get me back into the ivory tower again, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, no. And this, this is going to sound horrible. I'm sure it's going to come across the wrong way, but during the pandemic, I think the anal analyst life was about as good as it gets. You get to sit in the ivory tower and never travel and do all of your stuff over zoom all day. It probably was like death by zoom though. Probably yeah. they probably are so sick of zoom. Oh, oh gosh. They, I got, I got to imagine they're done with zoom. Well, like eight, eight to 10 hour days straight with zoom calls as an analyst. Holy smokes. That would be the worst. <laughs> that would be the worst. Tyler, you kind of sound like get off my lawn, dude. Like these current analysts, they have it so easy. Back in my day, <laughs> my we, day. <laughs> we had top status on United. Yes. No, I was Delta guy. I was the Diamond Delta for four years. So, <laughs> yeah, it happens. It happens to all of us. Um, actually, you brought up a topic I want to press on a little bit because of your background in, uh, in the military and, and intelligence and having a little bit of a hook there. Uh, I want to touch on Russia, Ukraine. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily want to ask the questions exactly listed in our pre-show notes, but what's your take on that and how that is affecting cybersecurity in the United in the United States and in companies that we, in the United States and the in the companies that that we help advise and guide, right? Um, should we all be freaking out and going, oh my God, we're all going to be targets for cyber attack now from Russia. They're all pissed off at us for sanctions. I know you you had a couple of really interesting and great blog posts uh, about this topic. So just give us the TLDR on your thoughts on that conflict and how it impacts the US. I mean, I think it's maybe contrarian. I think it's a distraction for most organizations uh, that are out there. I like to talk about threat models. If you look at your threat model, these are the, there's application threat modeling where you you know, Tyler, you will know way more about this sure. being an AppSec dude, right? But then there's the more holistic threat model. And it's like, yep. who are the threats that are most likely to target my organization? And I would say that for most people, it's it's commodity cybercrime. It's very likely untargeted ransomware because you're mm -hmm. running, talk about attack surface. Your attack surface has got some, you know, public facing service you didn't know about. You don't have multi-factor authentication. You don't have good, strong multi-factor authentication on it. Um, that people are getting in. So I think there was a lot, it was an education opportunity for us, you know, communicating up the chain of command for most organizations. You're not in the threat model of a Russian APT like mm. Sandworm, which is a very common one uh, of, of targeting you. So I think we have to be kind of careful and not get into the fear, uncertainty and doubt component. Uh, you certainly could have like the not Petya from several years ago, which maybe listeners will remember that, right? It was the wormable exploit off some NSA tools uh, that were released that went everywhere. It cost Merck's, Merck, the global shipping company, like billions of dollars um, uh, range there. You know, that could happen. But I think for a lot of people, the Russia-Ukraine stuff has been a distraction. I mean, it's absolutely horrible. And I don't want to take away yeah, from that. It's totally. totally not a distraction for people in region and stuff like that. But I think a lot of people got spun up about it. Meanwhile, it's like, hey, RDP, hey, VPN, hey, Microsoft OWA services that aren't deployed correctly that could let any threat actor in, right? So it, it, it's it's tough. Yeah. So what what I'm hearing there is a little bit of of maybe looking at hey, let it doesn't really change our our potential risk. It doesn't really change the threat landscape for us as a majority of companies. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're a, a you know an ICS company, industrial, yeah. you know a, a target of of nation state security level, sure, I get it. But what you're saying is hey. Spend that time shoring up your hygiene, getting the basics under control and making sure that you have the fundamentals in place. Yeah, the basics. He did, he did air quotes for those of you that are just listening instead of viewing. Uh, yeah, get the basics in place. Get the, get the cyber hygiene in place, right? Put password managers in, in play, unique passwords for your accounts, back up your data, right? Do, do all the right things at that level and then start. Well, you know, once you have all that under control, go ahead and worry about the advanced threats. 
Yeah, I mean, because you want to protect it. You want to build a program that's resilient, that's going to protect against 80% of the threats out there. And listen, if if a Russian APT or China APT or, or NSA is going to target someone, they're going to get in. They're probably not going to have to burn a zero day in a lot of cases. And why would they if they can go after something that's yep. been unpatched for 18 months or something along those lines? So yeah, build the build the fundamentals that are out there. And I think this is another important thing to realize, especially like Ivory Tower Rick would be like, do, do the basics, roll out multi-factor authentication. Well, if you're a fortune company, global, grown through M&A, you know, it's not easy to do the basics. So just saying do the basics doesn't mean they're easy. So you could have like a 24 month program, step by step, I wanna implement this and I'm gonna raise my, you know, capability a little bit more and improve my resiliency a little bit more and then not get distracted by, you know, the silver bullet, you know, marketing yep. stuff that you see out there as well. All the, all the stuff that people like me throw at you. Well, I'm a vendor too, so same thing. Yeah, but I'm the CMO, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's true. I do have credibility, unlike you. <laughs> oh, 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 pull the knife out. Burn. Pull the knife out. Ashley? Yes, I got a question. So um, earlier we were talking about how just doing the, like, the basics for threat intelligence, right? Track it. If you're not tracking it today, do it in an Excel sheet, right? At least start getting the data. Is that, I guess, is that lumped into the basics here that we're trying to oh, accomplish? That's a good question. Is the fundamentals of threat intelligence and, and, and threat modeling, at least, would you consider that the basics for most enterprise organizations? Not, not a mom and pop shop or anything like that, but a true enterprise organizations. Is that a basics yeah, level? It's a, that is a good question. I guess it depends on the extent that you would do it. I would say it's something you should have fundamentally in your program, but if you're a very immature shop, like CISA puts out alerts, like they just did one today on uh, Russia exploiting a print nightmare vulnerability. And they will put in there the techniques, tactics, and procedures that the adversary is using. They will give you indicators and things like that. So you can use, you could be a small regional, whatever, maybe, you know, community credit union or something like that. You could pull the data in there. And that's a really good starting block. I would start off with more of, can I patch my stuff first? Do I have the multi-factor authentication? Do I have my external attack surface sorted out first? Complement it with some of the free things from an ISAC. I guess that may not be free. The, the information sharing sure. groups that are out there. But I would not go straight into, I'm going to go out. If I don't have my VPN secured, I'm not going to go out and spend, you know, six figures on a threat intelligence provider. You know, that would be getting ahead of your skis a little bit. Hey, tie it back to skiing a little bit there. <laughs> 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 yes. And I've definitely tumbled. And I'm sure there are some other folks who, you know, are new to purchasing software and building their programs that may make the same, you know, tumble. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks for, you know, causing her to have a memory about the last fall she had over the weekend. <laughs> I'm sure she, she's up. really happy you brought that up. You know, I, I want to ask a question. I don't think there's too many people in the industry that I have. There, there's a few but there's not so many that I can actually ask this question to and feel like they have the knowledge to give me a truthful answer. You have been focused on threats for the better part of a decade or more, maybe even a decade and a half of threat analysis. Why am I still seeing zero day successfully exploited every year, every other year, massive, massive exploits? Are we getting better as an industry, like I, I look at what I, my, my background is in AppSec and now asset management and asset security. And I can comment on like maybe why we, you know, have or haven't gotten better in AppSec. And uh, largely for me, that's because of the transition to cloud and how we build apps and things have changed drastically causing new landscapes and, and opportunities to occur. Is it a similar thing when we think of the traditional attack threat vectors that are happening are we just never going to solve this problem is it is it a we're done we're toast forever or or can we someday fix this well i don't i don't think we should be fatalistic about it and you know by the hype i mean the truth is and you know this if it runs code it's vulnerable so yep. we will always have there will always be zero days that we always have to deal of deal with but i think what you want is you want the adversary to have to use a zero day on you you don't want them to have to go after a you know a 12 month old citrix patch that hasn't been applied that sort of thing now to get to to kind of your question there i think it, it, actually you know plug what y'all do understanding your attack surface and then mm -hmm. understanding john kinderbach actually he talks about protect surface which is a concept 
he, he, he talked to me about lunch in December that we had. He's like, you know, what are your most, you can't protect all the things. So what ah. are the most important things? So John kind of flips that on its side a little bit, but you know, because you can't do all the things we can't scan and patch all the things that, mm -hmm. you know, that we're be on that hamster wheel forever. So what are the most important things that you need to protect? Do you have the fundamentals in place so that you can kind of quickly detect and respond? But I don't think another, you've had this pendulum go back and forth over the years between it's all about prevention to know mm -hmm. it's not about prevention. It's only about detection and response. And I always say it's a mixture of both and we need to have more prevention because the more that you can prevent, the less you have to detect and sure. respond to or spend your time detecting and responding to lateral movement based off of a solar winds type of attack, that sort of thing. So I, I think the game is going to continue, but I don't think we should be fatalistic about it, but just try to, you know, try to make their jobs a little bit harder. It was a bit of a loaded question. I have, you know, I set you up there a little bit, right? Because I don't think there is right an right answer. I don't, I don't think we'll ever, we'll ever fix the problem. I think the problem just, you know, transforms evolves. into something else and morphs into something different, right? Because it's like, it's like trying to say, how do you stop theft in the physical world? Like you can put guards in play, you can, you know, put barriers up. And at some point in time, theft is always going to be possible. If somebody's dedicated enough, right? And has enough resources, they're always going to be able to do it. And I think it's very similar. It's about raising the bar so that everything gets a little bit better, right? Yeah, make it like they have to do an Ocean's Eleven <laughs> exactly. Crew <laughs> yes. To get you versus you know just Rick on the street walks in and you know steals the crown jewels. You know Rick on the, the street. I love that term. I might use that term going forward instead of saying man on the street. I'm just going to forever call it the Rick <laughs> on the street. So uh, those of you that are regulars on the show, when we're doing this, when we're doing this show a year from now, and I say Rick on the street, you'll all know where it came from. Maybe yeah, we can do that at Black Hat. It can be Rick on the street at your poolside uh, cabana. Which I, Actually, which be I'm careful what you, you will be, have. be careful. Be careful what you wish for. Ashley's going to be at RSA this year, and she's going to be doing some Rick on the street interviews, <laughs> and she may tackle you and make you do a Rick on the street <laughs> interview, like a real one. I'm down. <laughs> all right, Ashley. What else you got? Uh, curious question. Just because I'm not as well versed on threat intelligence. Are there metrics related to threat intelligence and ways for people to be able to see that they're making progress? Because I know earlier you said there's, you know, issues at the strategic level and whatnot. So I'm just, I'm curious if there's metrics related to it and if that somehow can be. Yeah. Story. So let me see. Let me try to think of a, because um, you could go into the weeds on this, but let me, let me try to simplify it a little bit. We were just having this conversation last week, actually. Um, really what threat intelligence is, is about questions that you would ask about the threat. And so we actually did a blog last week um, around intelligence questions you would have about the Russian Ukraine threat. We did it two weeks ago. And these could be the questions that your CISOs are asking, like, what's the, what's the likelihood that we're going to be targeted? What's the malware that they would use? So in the intelligence world, you have these questions that you want to get answered. And really they're about the adversary and the threats to maybe specific lines of business that you have. And then what you do is you map out like, how do I answer these questions? And that's your collection. Um, mm -hmm. And your collection could be, oh, I have CrowdStrike EDR running. Um, I have some kind of network security monitoring tool in place. So here's the question here's the tools that I have to answer. And then how good is it answering that question? So it could be, um, we have had these intrusions, we've captured it. And now we want to check and see where are our tools actually capturing it. Like I want to know how well is a security tool that's doing detection, detecting the bad things that I want to know about. And then you can kind of log it. And where I like it as a CISO, it's like, okay, I have these 20 tools in my portfolio and I have these let's call it 10 questions. This is how good my stack is about answering these questions. And if you're not answering a lot of the questions, maybe you have the wrong tool in place. Maybe you have the wrong mm. complete, you know, you know, you need something that does a better job of attack surface, right? Something along those lines to give you visibility. So you can have metrics I like around visibility, like how well can you see your environment? Can you see outbound DNS? And then when you have individual incidents, you know, you look, you do, after action review is what we talk about at Digital Shadows, but every time you have an intrusion or an incident, you do an after action review and like, how well did my detection and prevention infrastructure work? And then you start scoring on it. So that's just, that's one angle for it. That's probably a little bit more of a, you know, top down approach, you know, mm -hmm. cause you can obviously be like, this is how many indicators that I have and this is how many, but I think those are really 
not the best. Early days of Threat Intel, it was like, oh, I have this many indicators. And it's like, oh, I have this many indicators. Well, if they're not relevant to your organization, if they're not looking in the right places, then I question the value. So for me, I like to start at the, what are the questions that we need to be asking? How well can we collect against those? And then how does that drive the investment in my program? And then macro, pull it into like, okay, we just had this event happen. What, how did it happen? You know, how can we get better at it next time? Do companies typically have like overlapping technologies to answer those questions? Like, you know, <laughs> I guess the question, like, because in the conversation that I had with Sunil and his cyber defense matrix, right? He, you, you talk about different functionality and every vendor says they do everything under the sun, right? And then you have to go and dig and what they actually do. But there's obviously going to be some overlap depending on how you build out your stack. So is that expected? Is that desired? Is that a, I would love your thoughts. Yeah, on it's that. a really good question. Tyler will, will know this term. It may be the one good line. I, I, I already know where you're going. <laughs> it's, it's, it's expense and depth. Like people buy instead of defense and depth, they just buy more things. And then the vendor land actually uses defense and depth to sell you more things. It's like, oh, we need a layer defense. Why not have a checkpoint firewall and a Palo Alto firewall and that sort of stuff. So there's, there's definitely a component of we've just bought a lot of things. We don't validate how well those things are working. New thing comes out. We buy the new thing without good criteria to make the decision that 30 to 40% is overlap with the existing stuff. So I really think the kind of whole procurement and evaluation process that a lot of organizations do leads to expense and depth. Now, you can still have you know, a mature criteria-based approach to procurement, use cases, desired outcomes, and still have overlap between tools. Um, mm -hmm. So it could be desired overlap because there could be cases where you do want to have a separate, you know, another angle on something because it, it's actually interesting. There's been studies done on Threat Intel where if you look at, especially on the open source side, there's not that much overlap between a bunch of different providers that are out there. So maybe you do want to have more that mm -hmm. are in the mix. But I, I, I think people need to have like a rigorous process to understand their use cases to evaluate new technology pieces on what are the, I'll tie it back to Intel, what are the Intel requirements you're trying to answer and, and have that versus just, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to buy this. I now have 17 agents running on the host, you know, yep. killing all of the, the process and functionality there. So I think it's okay to have some overlap and it can be expected, but it just depends if you have like the fundamental things in place to bring the right solutions in house. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to shift our gears a little bit here. I want to, I want to go back to your analyst days and I want to ask you a question that you may not have an answer to. So feel free to say, I can't remember one. What is one funny story that you can remember? <laughs> funny moment, funny story, funny presentation, something that you were like, holy smokes, I can't believe that just happened from your analyst days. So, um, yeah, there's my, my favorite story is, is uh learning PG. How to we're PG on the show, FYI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's PG for sure. But it's, you know, you do these analyst briefings. So just like people that are listening out there, you get a briefing from a demo, a, a vendor briefing. They give you a demo. They have some slide where 30 minutes to an hour, you ask some questions. You know, one of the can be a beating for an analyst, you know, my first world analyst problems, you're getting vendor <laughs> briefings all the time. And you want to have them, right? Because especially from smaller companies, because they're the ones doing more innovative things. Uh, it's not the it's not the blue chip vendors that are innovating in the cybersecurity space. It's the scrappy startups and stuff like that. Um, and say they do vendor briefings for us. And I had, I had one that had a bit of a difficult relationship with the vendor on. They didn't like the way I was covering the space, whatever. But what they needed to learn was the difference between sharing application and sharing screen. So this whole briefing, they sh and you can imagine where this is going. They're sharing the screen. Um, and I don't say anything about it. I'm just like, let them, let them do that. Cause I'm an Intel guy, right? <laughs> like, here's an Intel collection source for me. And the, the briefing wasn't going well for them. And when, when they got done with the briefing, they had, I can't remember. It wasn't Slack up at the time. I don't remember what it was, but it was something like. Some I am. Some instant messenger. Yeah. Some and they started, yeah, they started S talking me <laughs> while sharing it on the screen. Um, and I didn't say anything. I didn't say a word. Um, and just continued on. But then when we got off the call, I then, you know, I, I think I, I think I texted the analyst relations person for that vendor and said, Hey, you realize that your, your person was sharing screen. I'm surprised you missed that. Uh, or in the whole screen. And they're like, Oh, uh Oh, uh -oh. Um, and so uh -oh. that made for a really funny one. The next interaction I had with them, but I was just like, 
yeah, you really got to be mindful, especially these <laughs> days, right? You got Slack, <laughs> Slack notifications popping yep. up, all these desktop notifications, always share application, never share the whole desktop. So, yeah, no, I, you go ahead. Ed. Uh, I'm curious because, you know, y'all are besties, right? And so I want to know, what was your first impression of Tyler? Oh, Ooh. Uh oh, well, how did you uh -oh. meet him? I, I can answer that for him. He was in awe. <laughs> Look at this guy. This guy's got a full hair. head of hair. He's so sexy. Uh, Look at this guy. No, no, no. I think it, it would have been remote. Because you interviewed me, didn't you? We did it the interview process, but it would have been remote. It wasn't. It wasn't in person. Um, you know, Tyler was uh, coming in from uh, what Veracode at the time, right? Yeah, I was. I was in R and D in Veracode. I was in the R and D yeah, yeah. side. So I just remember like, oh yeah, this is cool. This is this person that gets application security. I don't know anything Look about application security. And then I found after, you know, maybe three months, like, wow, there were so many other candidates that we could have hired <laughs> that <laughs> application security better. Um, oh, come like, on. He, he, seemed like come on. he seemed like an expert to a layman like me in this space. No, yeah, I, I faked it. I faked my way into it. You're absolutely right. I think music might be like the, the one like non-work thing that I would think of about Tyler was just music and guitaring and stuff like that on the side and things yeah it's sitting right there, there in, the background. One in the background right here i have a guitar right here on set have you been to any of his gigs <laughs> uh i have i i have not although i may have had the opportunity to because you did you did have the opportunity to you were in town but the the the, the challenge is is like my family lives i mean what some might say is, you know, a couple of days away from Tyler. And, and, and in fact, it's it's maybe a 25 minute drive um, uh, from him. So uh, you know, the joke that, for those of you that are <laughs> listening is that I refuse every time Rick comes out, he comes to, to Durham, which is about a 35 minute drive from where I live. And I always tell him, meet me halfway or come all the way to me. I'm too there's lazy no to come all the way out to Durham. No halfway. It's, you gotta come so he always gets scary. mad at me, tells me to come out to him and I refuse to do it. And so we don't end up getting together because we can never make the time work because 35 minutes is too far. <laughs> so I would wow, like so to, I would like to, I would like to see a show. We've had barbecue together multiple times. We have like multiple that. times in both places. Uh, no, no. Yeah, never. I had barbecue in Texas with you. We went to Heart 8. I thought you were going to say, sorry, I thought you were going to say Durham. because you. Oh, no, no, I don't go to Durham. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. Too far away. No, no, no. <laughs> yes, we have had Texas barbecue. I need to take you someplace better than Heart 8, though. Heart 8 was excellent. I thought it was very good barbecue. So here we are taking this thing all the way back to our original topic about barbecue. Um, and we can all agree that turkey barbecue with thick Memphis sauce is by far the best barbecue that you can eat. And that's what I would choose to eat. For the rest of my life, if I could only eat one barbecue, no sauce. I don't like sauce. Oh my gosh! Wow, you don't like sauce? That, that's a that true. A that's very, actually a true barbecue aficionado, right there. That's a very Texas thing too. Like, it, it, like you go to KC, big on sauce, and then yeah. of course in the Carolinas, you have you know, vinegar, vinegar sauce. sauce. You have white. You have white sauces there too. Yeah. Like in Texas, it's it's just a rub. Now I may have some sauce, and a lot of Texas barbecue places will include sauce because people will ask for it, but. Generally, the Texas, you know, ivory tower barbecue position is it's about the meat, not about the sauce type of thing. Yeah. But I, I will I will try sauces, too. Like I say, I'm an equal opportunity. I will eat whatever is the most popular food in the region of the world that I'm in. That is fantastic. Okay. That is fantastic. So, Ashley, we're at uh, we're coming up on that moment. Oh, do you have one more question before yeah, we go into I the? Do. OK, hit it. This is, I wanted to before we get into our game, I wanted to ask one other question. Because I noticed on your Twitter feed, you disconnected, you went on vacation. Oh, yeah. And, oh. you know, during, uh, you know, after high stress time. So I'm wondering, one, did your Forrester days kind of contribute to you really building in those hard boundaries? Hmm. And then the second part of that question is, how has that kind that rhythm of taking breaks and rest helped you lead your teams? Well, I think one of the reasons I try to do is I want to model it for the team. So I took six days off in a row and I was still on Twitter tracking what was going on in Russia and Ukraine, but I wasn't working. Um, and I would have done that anyway, because I'm a former Intel dude. I'm a national security, national defense geek. So that that I liked, but I didn't work for six full days. Um, and it was it was great. And we've been talking to the teams in particular, like, you don't have to be a threat until shop. If you're defending a network right now, again, like solar winds, then half neum, and then the summer of extortion, 
Um, and then, of course, Log4j. And then now this starting off the year, it's just like one thing after another, punch, punch, punch. So we want to model to our teams that we need to take time off. Like a to-do list is never is never going to be checked off. Never. So I got, I, I feel pretty good now. We'll see how I feel tomorrow. I'm still <laughs> waiting through the email and things like that, but yeah, we've got to be refreshed. And I think it, part of it may have gone back to my time as an incident responder and in, in EDU and higher ed, because we had an intrusion that's public at the university that I worked at where, you know, we were doing really long shifts for many, many days. And we started doing rotations to try to keep people fresh because you can't do incident response work if you're exhausted. So I just think it's really, really, especially now, it's so hard to defend networks out there, you know, shout out to all the practitioners and stuff like that is a real challenge. So if you're not yep. fresh, you're going to burn out and you know, it, it's not going to be good for you personally, health, your families, it's yeah. not going to be good for the business either. So I, 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 I do that too, right, Ashley? I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I, I make it a point to, uh, to take care of myself and take time off and, you know, model it the way you guys should be doing it. Right. She's laughing because it's, it's like, totally he's BS. a hair model right now. Yeah, it's total BS. I do not do that. I need to do a better job of that for sure. I do not take care of myself in any way, shape or form. Although, although I am trying to drink more water, I'm keeping it simple. I thought you were just going to say, I am starting to drink. More <laughs> I'm starting to drink more. <laughs> although, although many times on the show, I have had beer and or bourbon on the show. So eh, you know what you gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep it simple. I will say though, you do make room for your team to take time off. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. But I really wish I could be a exemplar for you and i'm just not good at it but i it's, do it's i do hard to do I, it is I, hard. Did it, I did it last week but mostly because the thursday before my vacation so one week into the um to the invasion i was up at 5 a.m for a webinar and i was oh, at a geez. customer event with a partner until 9 p.m and i was just you know i did two days worth of work in one one day and it had been like that so normally i actually do check in but i was like i've got to refresh so i'm not Good for you. I'm not that great at at staying checked out, especially when you're trying to help run different functional areas and you, you do have to stay in. But I just thought it was extremely important for us in the time that we have right now for for Digital Shadows employees to to see me taking time off and truly disconnecting so that it would make them feel like they can do the same thing and it's okay. Good for you. That's I need to do it more. I need to do it more though. Well, I need to learn how to do it, period, let alone do it more. But I do I do actually tell my team, look, you know, you look a little tired. Look, let's get some time. Let's let's take care of yourselves, right? So I only half joke when I say I'm a crappy example, but all right. Yeah, you just work hard, which uh, I appreciate sure. out of my boss. That's so. what I appreciate about Good you, enough. Ashley. Thanks. All right. Um, See, my lovely co-host. Yeah, he it. man, he so much it. love going down. Here. <laughs> it is a bit of a love it. fest here. It. I kind of, I kind of like the vibe going on, and and I love you too, Rick. So just let you know. <laughs> All right, game time. Are we ready for game thirty? Yes. So first, I just I forgot to do this at the beginning. I meant to do this at the beginning, but this is. <laughs> the Rick and Tyler show today. So thank you all for joining oh, nice. us. She's um, the derpiest photo. Bring that back up. Actually, bring up the zoomed in version of the derpy photo. Bring up the zoomed in version. Why do we have the derp photo? Like, can't we have one? Like, there's got to be other. Fo- and not only that, but you have a mouse like stuck in the middle of my nose in the screenshot <laughs> at that. Like, yes, come on. sorry. <laughs> come on. Do better. Do better, Ashley. Well, All you right. Can't do better. You, see you can't do better. That up. For this, right? Rick, you're kind of derpy in your photo there too, buddy. Just saying. That's a new one. That's a new one, I think. I think I just I, that She up. screenshotted that's you live, I bet. No, that's his LinkedIn, man. Oh, Why are you that's, uh, his LinkedIn? that's your official yeah, headshot? That's my professional. That's my OS. Professional one. I got to do better a, than that. That's an interview <laughs> with, uh, I think, a San Francisco news outlet on, actually, that day that I did the, the Thursday of the week of the invasion or whatever, that was a media interview that I did. Well, they got a good shot of you, buddy. All right, what's the game, Ash? All right, so in light of the hottest topic that we've been talking about today, which is barbecue, we are going to do a barbecue trivia. Oh, 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 you are setting me up for failure. (laughs) You did did good on music trivia last time. So part of the running joke that Ashley complains about me trying to only set up games or push her to set up games where I'm going to win, right? So she's making it a point, I think, to find games that I'm going to lose. Yeah. Unfortunately, poor Jason Chan, he also was like, yeah, classic rock trivia. I'd be down for that. Um, Until he wasn't as good as me, just saying. <laughs> now, I have, to, I have to say I'm a bit of a gambling man, so I'm going to give two to one odds that Rick is going to win here. So I'm the underdog for sure. Okay. 
Doesn't All mean right. I'm going to give you any preferential treatment. Just Let's go. Know. I'm giving it my best. Come on. All right. So basically, first person to answer, I've got uh, well, 10 questions here. First person um, to answer, or are you going to go in turn? I mean, we can go either way. And then All the right. other person has a chance to steal. We'll do that. Okay. So we'll start. We'll start with Rick. You can tell we're real prepared here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, there's multiple ways to run the game, right? So All right, Ash, hit it. Okay. Uh, where does the word barbecue come from? Multiple choice. So is it created by George Washington to describe grilling? Is it from the wor Spanish word barbacoa? Uh, or is it named after a French-American chef named Barbara Q? Number two. <laughs> Number two. Number two. That is correct. Barbacoa. Um, okay, look at that. You learn something new every day. Today I learned. Uh, bonus fact, barbecue comes, yeah, so we already know that. Uh, it's used as a cooking term by the Caribbeans, um, and it's translated to mean a framework of sticks upon posts. So today we call it a spit, um, that long oh. metal rod. Yeah. That's cool. But, I didn't know that. Um, well, yeah. now you know. Fun facts. All right, Tyler. Yes. What causes the red or pink ring that appears in meat after it's been smoked? Is it a chemical reaction involving nitrogen dioxide? Is it uh, the wood particles from charcoal that discolor the meat? Or is it the ring that shows that the meat is not yet fully cooked? I must say the first one. Very good. Yes. It is a chemical reaction. Um, so Ooh. the smoke rings are created Tired. through a chemical reaction between myoglobin so the protein in the muscle tissue and nitrogen dioxide when, um, and it's released when the wood burns. The nitrogen All right. Dioxide. Very cool. One to one. All right. Uh, Rick, what is the largest barbecue competition in the world? Oh, oh, so you got to know this one. I have okay. two, I have, oh, it's a multiple choice though. That's right. I forgot. Do you, do you want multiple choice? Um, no, yes, I do, because there's two options that I'm thinking of. Okay. So your options are Memphis in May, um, Houston Livestock Show, and ro uh, the Rodeo World right Championship Contest. No, he knows it's going on right now. <laughs> and the uh, Or the American Royal World Championship. It's the uh, third one. Yes. So it's host wow. that one is hosted in Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah. Um, it's been dubbed the World Series of Barbecue, uh, with 500 teams competing and 70,000 spectators. Wow, the and fact you know, that you got that's pretty impressive. I Memphis and May was my number two one on that one. Um, if 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 that one didn't make it in, I was going to go Memphis and May, which I do want to do an event at. I want to do a cybersecurity vendor event at Memphis and May. Sign us up, <laughs> Jupiter One's on board. Let's go. <laughs> Very nice. Would you ever compete at any of these? Um, actually I was, I just went to, a, 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 a camp brisket at Texas A&M university uh, about six weeks ago. And I was talking to some of the faculty there about competition and how it's different than cooking for food. So yes, I am interested in doing like, it's very different cooking style. You get one bite, it's different than restaurant cooking. So I am interested in it. Hmm. Nice. All right. Two to one. Yes. Um, all right, Tyler, which region in the USA has the fewest barbecue restaurants per capita? Ooh. The Great Multiple Lakes choice. region? The what? Great Lakes, Re Great Lakes region, New England, Pacific Coast. Wow. That's tough because the Pacific Coast is big. It's long. There's a whole lot of stuff that could be done there. Great Lakes is actually where I grew up. And there's not there's not much good barbecue there at all. It's pretty horrible, actually. And New England, oh, I'm gonna go Great Lakes. Incorrect. Oh. It is New England. Oh, that was the one. It was debate between those I two. I would have gone. I would have gone Great Lakes too, though. Yeah, I grew up there. The only the only good barbecue there is the Dinosaur Barbecue in Syracuse, New York. Other than that, there's a whole lot of nothing for barbecue. All righty, so two to one. Rick you, has the lead. You better get this right. I'm coming for you next round. I feel like a lot of pressure here, too. <laughs> <laughs> this game is really important. Every every episode, this game is like the most important thing we do. So don't screw this up. <laughs> yeah. Well, not only that, I mean, he he's a self-proclaimed 
barbecue enthusiast. That's why I don't say expert. I'm an enthusiast. Yes. Enthusiasts can get things wrong. <laughs> this is true. He's just an enthusiast. All righty, Rick. Uh, which state has the most barbecue restaurants per capita? Your choices are Oklahoma, Montana, or Missouri. Oh, whoa. wow. That's a tough one. I whoa. like this one. Oklahoma. I'm watching him squirm, folks. I'm watching him squirm. Oklahoma, Montana, or Missouri? Mm-hmm. Those are the options? Mm-hmm. Oh, my per gosh, capita. Man. Oh, so we could have dropped in a little bit of a tip Montana. there per capita. Montana. Incorrect. Oh. It is actually Oklahoma that has the most barbecue restaurants per capita. I would not have a However, barbecue. Ugh. Un- Fun fact, uh, Montana leads the country in online searches for barbecue ribs per capita. Hmm. Okay. Random fact, yes. I mean, I'm just reading off of this trivia, so. All right. I get a chance to tie, and then we're going to go to the tiebreaker. Yes. Uh, What is the most popular wood used in smoking meat? I think I know this already, but go ahead and give me the multiple choice. Oak, hickory, mesquite. Ooh, I don't know this. (laughs) <laughs> it's definitely not oak I was going to say c- cedar but that's because I don't know what I'm talking about clearly so it's, it's got to I mean, be that's what I see most frequently it's either mesquite or hickory but I think both are super popular I'm going to go with mesquite incorrect oh, it's actually oak. oak yeah no mesquite, way oak mesquite, mesquite and hickory have very very strong flavors so you right. can use them with much meat Oak, oak is the thing in Texas as well. That's like the main one there. Hmm. So does we're letting him steal this point too? No, I didn't. I didn't say it's it. Though, game right? over. It's game this over. I can't compete. I can't compete. I, I giving up. Tyler? I give up. I throw in the towel. Give me, I give, me, I, give me the final question, but don't tell me any answers. And let me just see ooh. if I can get the final question. Right. That way we can, you know, we, we can determine whether you're an enthusiast or an expert based on <laughs> okay, this question. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, mm, okay. What are the main four regional types of barbecue in the USA? Uh, Texas, Carolinas, Kansas City. What would the fourth one be? Can I help? Yeah, no. go ahead. Memphis. Yeah, go ahead. Memphis. Oh, yeah. You're probably right. It's Tennessee. Good job, team effort. Woo! Yeah, team effort. <laughs> yes, sir. We got it. <laughs> all right um any parting thoughts anybody no thanks for having me yeah it was awesome catching up with you buddy i hope the i hope the uh the audience enjoyed it oh we got to do the the typical smash the like button hit the notify button hit the subscribe button do all those things do all those things that, yeah point down hit them hit the like button all the millennial terms yep so i can be an old head uh no rick it was awesome seeing you again my friend thank you for your time we really appreciate you coming on and giving us a whole bunch of intel on Threat Intel. So appreciate it, my friend. All right, thanks. All right, get the hell off my show. Get him out of here. Get him off my show. All right, Ash. Thanks All right. for uh, stumping the chump when it comes to barbecue. I clearly don't know what I'm talking about with barbecue. It's okay. I mean, cedar planks, I, I, if I didn't have the choices, I, the first thing that popped in my head was cedar for that question. So Yeah, see, so you just set That's... me up for failure. <laughs> well, hey, All right. it's part of the fun, isn't it? It is. It is part of the fun, I guess, setting me up for failure. All right, Ashley, it's been a wonderful show. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Uh, folks, if you're still here, our next show is on April 5th. It's Remember, we're on the first and third Tuesdays of every month. So um, hope to see you then. And until next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye.